I think most of you know Bill Gelber of the theater department, uh, who is a director of Shakespearean drama uh, and a student <coughs> of the staging of Shakespeare. And I gather in Shakespeare's time, uh, the actors, maybe Shakespeare himself as an actor, probably would have participated in what we now call direction. Right. So, uh, I want to thank him and uh, please give him a hand. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk today about Shakespeare's director, and there wasn't a director during that time, we'll talk about that, but I feel like the way that he wrote his plays allowed for a lot of direction by him to the people who were actually performing his plays. Uh, I should preface also by saying that Dr. Samuel Johnson is supposed to have said that quoting Shakespeare's lines in order to convince people of his greatness and his plays is rather like trying to sell a house by carrying around a brick and showing it to people. But I'm going to go ahead and do some quotes today. I'm actually going to quote from the plays to give you some example of how his work might go. So there were a lot of challenges during that time. They wouldn't have seen them that way, but we might if we were looking back. The rehearsals for the plays were extremely limited. For one thing, they had performances in the afternoon. And uh, so they could mainly rehearse in the morning. And they only had about 10 days at the most to put on the play. You can imagine Hamlet, which can run at four and a half hours sometimes on cut. You know, they don't have a lot of time to put that together. <coughs> so there's no director at that time either, as the term is used today. And the actors all knew their business. Probably Richard Burbage, the lead actor, had something to say about who stood in front of him or not. And uh, we know that Shakespeare was an actor in the company and probably was there for consultation if need be. There was one full script for the actors because there was no copyright at that time. And in fact, scripts were sometimes stolen by other companies. They would have spies sit in the audience and write down lines from the plays. And so what they would do is they would have the book holder, and that was his name, hold on to one copy, which he would lock away in a trunk. They would then copy out parts for everybody else. And all of those parts would have would be their lines and four words of the cue before them. And these were made into little rolls or scrolls that they could then study. This is where we get the word roll from. Here is your roll, your roll of paper. <laughs> okay. And you can tell whether you had a big part or a little part because the rolls were either big or, or small, right? And playing in rep meant they had to learn a lot of lines. Um, John Barton talks about knowing about uh, an actor who apparently appeared in 57 plays, a company that did 57 plays in one year, had to learn lines for all of those. And you imagine these plays aren't short, they're five act plays, and if you're the lead actor, you're learning Hamlet, you're learning Othello, you're learning all those big roles. So they had to have prodigious memories. But as I'm gonna talk about in a minute, the way that Shakespeare wrote also helped with that, helped memorization. So some pluses. This is a company that really cared about each other and was together for years. And when they did plays together, their house playwright, Shakespeare, knew of their quality and he also knew the kind of roles that they could do. So he would often write, well, he would always write parts for the people that he had. There was then typecasting, so that there were certain uh, roles that went to certain types of people. Of course, Richard Burbage always got to play the lead role. There also, we think, were two young boys who, as you probably know, there were no women actually performing these plays, and even the great, all of the great female roles, such as Rosalind and As You Like It and Lady M from the Scottish play, were played by young men. And that we think that there were two young men in particular that kept showing up in the comedies. One was a tall blonde, and one was a short brunette. And they show up a lot as Hermia and Helena in What's a Red Stream, uh, and I think Julia and Sylvia in Two Gentlemen of Verona, etc. Et 
and we have the people that play the kings. And we have the fool. So we have these superb performers who are playing all these different roles. Now the fool was interesting because uh, we think that, that Will Kemp was with the company for a certain amount of time, and then he was replaced by a man named Robert Arman, and that they were different kinds of comedians. And so that Will Kemp's, eh, this is a general statement, but Will Kemp's comedy was more broad than Robert Arman's, and so the comedy later on has a different feel to it because a different actor is now playing all of those parts. And we have a great playwright. And by the way, this is the, a picture of the New Globe. I don't know, have any of you been to see it? Yeah, it's a wonderful space. I think they're still trying to figure out where these columns should go, because I think they've been moved, actually. They, they, for sightline purposes, they're not great, because everybody's all out here, and anybody stands over there, and you're over here. You can't see them. <coughs> but we think that, they think as much as they can, that this is a fairly accurate representation of what it might have been like originally. If you get a chance to see the plays there, one of the things they discovered is that um, it's a really interesting form of performance because it's during the day, and they can, the audience can see you and you can see them. So there's this incredible interaction between the actors and the audience, which they're discovering more and more about. Uh, there's a a replica of the indoor theater that Shakespeare used called the Blackfriars Theater. It's in Staten, Virginia. And there's a company that is housed in that, in that theater, and they're really marvelous at that kind of interaction between the text and their performance and the audience. They even have audience sitting on the sides of the stage, and they'll often interact with them. So how did it work? Well, we think now that uh, one of the things that's come up is that people were actually paid just to come up with plots. That they had the idea for how this play might go, and then it was assigned to other people. Uh, so you could make some money just coming up with an idea for a story, but then someone would say, well, I'll write it. It's rather like TV today. <laughs> like a showrunner has these ideas, and then these episodes are farmed out to everybody else. That's one version of a plot. We'll talk about another in a minute. Then we might have writers who work on plays on their own, but they took their plots often from other sources. Uh, a form of plagiarization, if you will, but kind of classic stories that they might have read in books, etc., that they then adapted to their own purposes. A lot of Shakespeare plays are like that. So once the play was actually picked, uh, the way it started was the playwright actually read the play to the company. <laughs> read every part, read the whole thing out. That's how they started. Then one script was copied into parts and distributed in roles. And they had to learn their lines and the cues on their own. So when they finally came in to run the play, they did it as a performance, off book, all memorized to see where they were. The other rehearsals would be to finely tune them, but also for things like sword fights that they had to work out, dances, etc. But again, very limited amount of time. So they were expected to come in with a pretty good idea of how they were going to do the role. And, they put, and then they would perform it for the audience. And you know, that it's funny that uh, it's only after the, the first performance, in a way, is almost a dress rehearsal itself, too, because it's only after the play has appeared <clears throat> two or three times that they realize it's a success and the author's actually going to get paid. And they really are continuing to dress rehearse, in a way, because the real money is if they're invited to court and they get to perform the play for Queen Elizabeth or later King James. So, in a sense, they're also auditioning for that. <laughs> and then the book holder during the performance could also not only hold that book, the one copy, and prompt people to make sure that they remember things. Because, again, they're doing these plays in rap, and so, you know, it's Tuesday, it must be Hamlet. 
Um, you know, so they're going to be prompted about that, about those lines if they need be. But also, coordinate the scene changes, um, the special effects. Um, you can see some of the interesting special effects at the, the globe. They have some great displays about that. Like the thunder is a, it's a trough that they roll a, a metal ball down, and you can hear it. So. Um, but also the extras. You know, they were hire people on the day of the performance. Uh, because he wrote roles for about 15 people, and then everybody else was an extra. And they were able to, based on you know, the way they were maneuvered around and the way that people would talk to them on stage, they would be able to do it on the day because they would say, you know, um, seize that gentleman or whatever, and they, they'd know they were supposed to grab it. You know? And if, if the king went off and they were supposed to follow the king, they walked off with the king. See? Also, I, the actors probably knew where a lot of the scenes took place. Um, the king would often enter from the center <laughs> in the inner above, inner below. Uh, there, there are balcony. There is a balcony, so you know where the balcony scene possibly could have been. Um, and so there were certain zones of the stage. And there's a there's an author, for example, uh, and a theater practitioner by the name of Ben Iron Payne, who was also a disciple of. Um, William Pohl, and they talked about how if you could figure out what the zones were, you could kind of stage it perhaps in the way they might have using those areas of the state. They also had another kind of plot, uh, which was a list of the scenes in order with the people who were in them. So if you weren't sure you were in the next scene, you could look and say, oh, okay. And it's very possible that they also maybe had some props listed there too. Bring the ring on, you'll need it. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, Shakespeare was at those rehearsals, so, and he appeared as a, an actor in the play. But he, I, again, what I wanted to get at today was he also added clues as to how to perform his scripts in the writing itself. First of all, just very briefly, I want to say that, you know, he used a particular verse form that came from Sackville and Norton. They wrote this play called Gorbaduck, and they, they used this poetic form of the play. Uh, basically, I am the pentameter and blank first. And what we mean by that is that each line of the of the speech would be about ten syllables long. I say sometimes eleven because poets are allowed to cheat a little bit. And each of the lines is made up of two syllable feet, five two syllable feet, with a stress on the second syllable for the I am the pentameter. So penta means five, ia means uh, the stress on the second syllable for two syllables. You add that together, you get five iams per line. Just to give you an example here, um, if we think of the first syllable as being unstressed in each foot and the second syllable being stressed in a what you would call a regular pentameter line, you have uh, some of the starts of some of the plays. So, for example, the first line in Twelfth Night is Arsino's, If music be the food of love, play on. Can you hear it? If music be the food of love, play on. He's stressing that every other syllable. It's the same in the first line of Merchant of Venice. Antonio, who is the merchant, says, In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. So, you have alternating music be the food of love play on and in sooth I know not why I am so So first of all just the, the very poetic form he used was helpful but he could also using that form and using writing within that form he could tell the actors a number of things. He could tell them what to stress he could tell them also where to pause. He could tell them where to pick up cues. I'm going to talk about all these things. Where to overlap the dialogue, even, we think. Where to speed up. Where to slow down. And then what to do. Some of the business, gestures, etc. So what to stress? If we use a regular contaminant line, the stress is pretty easy. It has that de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum pattern. 
if you listen to it carefully, what is it sound like? Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. It sounds like a heartbeat, right? In music, be the food of love, play on and soothe thy not why I am so sad. But that the thing that happens with Shakespeare is he doesn't do that all the time. It would kind of drive you crazy and wouldn't always feel very realistic. But more importantly, he might want to make the speeches more exciting and stress other things. And so he would put the stresses in what we would call the off position in order to call attention to certain syllables and certain words. Here's an example. Henry V is supposed to try to get his men to go over the breach and take the, take the town. If he was to do this in the regular item of the temperature, it would sound like this. Once more, and to the breach, dear friends, once more. Does anybody want to go over the wall with that? <laughs> Probably not. But if he stressed the, the syllables the way they look on the page, in a natural way, you get once more into the breach, dear friends, once more. You see? So he's trying to get people to go over. Does that make sense? Well, the first line uh, in Taming of the Shrew is Baptistus. Uh, suitors come to woo, uh, ask him for his daughter's hand, and he says to them, this line. Now, if he said it in a regular iambic pentameter, it would sound rather ridiculous. Then told me, importune me no further. That wouldn't make much sense. But the point is, he's trying to stop them from talking. Gentlemen, importune me no further. You see? So these are the new stresses. Once could also be one. Once more, a two, a breach. They have friends. Gentlemen, that would be that would be wrong, right? And then so you'd have to stress once more unto the breach, your friends, once more. Or gentlemen, importune me no further. Would be the fur, not the thumb. He also puts in pauses. Because he gives us short lines. If someone is talking in this ten syllable form, and they don't finish the syllables, it's an indication by him that there's a pause. So King Lear, when he's talking to Kent, wants him to shut up, and then he's going to go on. Peace, Kent. No more syllables. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. So first he says, you know, shut up, and make sure he shuts up, and then he goes on. Juliet has just met Romeo, and as they're leaving, she says, what's he that follows here that would not dance? She doesn't necessarily have any lines right away. She has a three-syllable line. It's possible, and it can be staged that way, that she goes, she says, what's he that follows here that would not dance? I know not. <laughs> right? There are also what are called shared lines, which means that when you look at the page, one line is a certain number of syllables, and then by a character, and the next character has the rest of the lines, the rest of the syllables. So in The Merchant of Venice, Portia is interrogating Shylock in the trial scene, and she says, is your name Shylock? This is five syllables, and he replies, Shylock is my name. He's ready to get on with it. He has business to take care of. So he picks up the cue, and it's one ten syllable line. Is your name Shylock? Shylock is my name. Bolingbroke is talking to Richard II as he's being deposed. He says, The shadow of your sorrow has destroyed the shadow of your face. That's six syllables. Richard says, Say that again. So if you put this together, you get the shadow of your sorrow has destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. Now here's a, here's a section of the scene in which Richard III is trying to woo the Lady Anne. There's a picture of Olivier doing that. He lives and loves thee better than he could. That's a full line. Lady Anne says, name him. 
to two syllables. Plantagenet, four syllables. We still haven't gotten to ten yet. Why that was he. So all of that goes together. Name him Plantagenet, that why that was he. The self-same name of one of better nature. That's a whole ten syllables. Where is he? Three syllables. Here, he says. She spits on it at him. Why dost thou spit at me? The spit doesn't get an extra syllable, by the way. <laughs> But it's more exciting that way because they're picking up their cues and they're going back and forth and he's written that in there for the actors. Now in the, in the folio, uh, the later collection of his work, it's not always printed that way. So, you, so editors have actually found ways to kind of lay this out on the page for you, uh, doing the math, you know, and saying, oh, this is six, that's four, et cetera. Sometimes it's weird because you have uh, a four syllable line then you have a six-syllable line, and then you have another four-syllable line. So you have to decide <laughs> which one is a shared line and which one is a short line. You see, because it could either be four and six or six and four. Does that make sense? <coughs> one, of the most, uh, one of the most famous passages that, that, that shows this, it's, it's uh, often acted out as an example of how this works, is that King John, has asked you were to, he's going to ask them to kill a young boy. And when they get to the moment where they're going to agree to do so, he says, death. Nine syllables. Hubert then says, my lord, he says, a grave, he shall not live, he not. So, he has death. Hubert realizes what, what, realizes what he's saying. My lord, a grave, he shall not live, he not. It's like, get it, got it, good. So you have these 10 syllables shared between two people back and forth, which is really exciting. A short line followed by four words. We think that there might be overlapping dialogue, and there are books about it. Um, in, in Hamlet, you know, there's that moment when he when he jumps into the grave, uh, Ophelia's grave, when he comes back, and he, from England, or on his way to England, and he starts fighting with Laertes. You see, they already have a shared line here because they're fighting. The devil think they sold out. Praise the devil! You know, he's, he's, Laertes is attacking him. And he goes on, and we have these other lines, pluck them asunder, Hamlet, Hamlet, good my lord, be quiet. And then he says, I will fight with him upon esteem until my eyes is no longer wet. Well, these are, you know, these are short lines that we suspect could be just thrown in as they're grappling. And it might look like this. I pretty think this is for the of asunder. Uh, for though I am not splendid to arrive, Hamlet, Hamlet, uh, yet I have something in me dangerous which let thy wisest fear hold up thy hand. Okay, by the way, be quiet. You see, it's, they're trying to stop them. There's a really interesting passage like this that, that I tried out, which was fun to play, is that after Juliet takes the, you all know Romeo and Juliet, after she takes that potion and falls asleep and we think that she is dead, or the parents think that she's dead, when they come in to wake her for her wedding day, the nurse, Lady Capulet, Lord Capulet, uh, and Paris find find her dead, and they each have a speech that's six lines long. Paris has a four-line one. But it's possible that they are actually doing this lament together. It actually works really well that way, because they're, it's like a keening in a way, and they're all basically saying the same thing, the lack of these kind of things. Rather than each having a, a speech about that, and the others are waiting to, to emote, uh, they all emote together. Speaking faster is possible because you simply put multi-syllable words into your, your speeches. Here Claudius says, but to persevere an obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness, it says unmanly grief. 
She, Portia, in the trial scene, says, the quality of mercy is not strained. Baptista says, in this other line, gentlemen, importune me no further. These are faster because they're multi-syllable words. Discredit my authority with yours, says Anthony and Anthony. On the other hand, single-syllable lines slow everything down. John Martin likes to say that perhaps this line, every single word gets a stress. <laughs> they're all single syllables. Polina is saying to Leontes that actually his, his queen was not betraying him. And she says, good queen, and he says, well, you know, he, he argues with her, and she says, good queen, my lord, good queen, I say, good queen. Let's her take her tongue. Othello's speech over Desdemona before he smothers her has a lot of single syllable lines. It is the cause, it is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste star. It is the cause. It takes nothing. And then Lady Percy, when she tries to get Hotspur not to go off the bat, her husband says, Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. It gives her, it gives her the opportunity to slow it down. Now, I should say that. Though the opportunity exists, you don't always have to do it that way. I've often seen Lady Percy burst in with that and try to stop him from running away. Also, he mixes them so that you get an interesting effect. Richard II is about to be deposed and he has this wonderful speech, very famous. And in a section of it, he does this Cover your head. And mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends, subjected thus. How can you say to me, I am a king. A lot of singles. In Much Ado, when we uh, did the play last semester, we found this passage. Claudio suspects the hero has, he, he's convinced that she is unfaithful to him, and at, her, at their wedding, he actually rejects her. And she blushes, and he says, and she's blushing because she's innocent, but he can, he's, he basically accuses her of performing. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself at all? Comes not this blush as modest evidence to witness simple virtue? Would you not swear, all you that see her, that she were a maid by these exterior shows? But she is none. See how it works? Two. Here's another really important confession that's more powerful because she does it with four single syllable words. The Countess suspects that Helena, who works for the household, is in love with her son, the Count. And she finally gets her to admit it. And she says, Then I confess here on my knee, before high heaven and you, and before you, and next unto high heaven, I love you, my son. The other thing that Shakespeare does is he doesn't just write in iambic pentameter of one verse, he also writes in prose. He writes in paragraphs like we do, in normal, normal writing, if you will. And he often gives effects that are, uh, that are important and give actors clues as to the tone of the piece. 
by switching back and forth between these two forms. So when I was directing Tom tonight, I found this note that said basically there's a point in the meeting between Violet and Olivia where you realize how Olivia feels. Because uh, Violet, uh, our heroine, is, is disguised as a young man, and he's been sent by her master, Count Arsino, to try to convince Olivia that Count Arsino loves him, loves her, and to, to get an answer that will be in favor of his love. And instead, what happens is Olivia falls in love with Viola as the young man. <laughs> and there's a point in the scene where this happens. She's very abrupt with her at first. Now, so what is your text? My sweet lady, a comfortable doctrine and much may be said of it. Where lies your text? It's all in prose. In Arsino's bosom. In his bosom. What chapter of his bosom? Uh, I have, uh, this is still her line, sorry. I have read it, it is heresy. Have you no more to say? Then she says, you know, this isn't working. She's being very prideful. I want to see her face. Because the thing is, she's, she's still in mourning for her brother. It allows her not to have to commit to any other man. And uh, she's always veiled. And so Viola, understanding this, this ruse, decides to ask her to take the veil off. So she, or at least, so that she can now look into her eyes. And when she does, it goes into verse. I see you what you are. You are too proud. But if you were the devil, you were fair. You are fair. My Lord and Master loves you. Oh, such a love could be but recompense. Though you were crowned the non of beauty. She says, how does he love me? This is a shared life. With adorations. Fertile tears, with groans, with thunder love, with sighs of fire. Your Lord, she finally says a really honest answer. Your Lord does know my mind. I cannot love him. She has a speech in verse about that. It ends with, he might have took his answer long ago. Viola doesn't give up. If I did love you in my master's form, with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial I would find no sense. I would not understand it. Shared line, why, what would you? Uh-oh. <laughs> she then allows her one of the great passages in Shakespeare. <laughs> Very romantic. Make me a willow cabin at your gate, and call upon my soul within the house. Write loyal cantons of contented love, and sing them loud, even in the dead of night. Hallow your name to the reverberate hills, and make the babbling gossip of the air. Cry out, Olivia! Oh, you should not rest between the elements of air and earth, but you should pity me. To which Olivia replies, you might do much. <laughs> so it's this, you could argue that it's this change that allows, first of all, for Violet to get through to her. But unfortunately, she accidentally loses her for herself. But she uses verse to do it. Also, Shakespeare uses the idea of the you and thou that they use. The you is addressed to another person who is less intimate than thou. It's, it's very much like in German where they say sie or du, depending on how close you are to the person, or who and to. And you can see that in verse here in Twelfth Night, because uh, when Viola comes back to see Olivia, because the, the Duke says, I want you to go back again and get the answer. And the problem is Viola doesn't want to go back because she knows that Olivia is interested in her. And so she comes back and Olivia is going to, rejo is going to say, okay, I know you don't want me. And she says, be not afraid of youth, I will not have you. And yet when wit and youth has come to harvest, you are as, as like to reap a proper man. There lies your way due west. And she says, then west we're out. She's ready to go. Grace and good disposition to attend your ladyship. You'll nothing, madam, to my lord by me. She stops her. Stay. I pray thee, tell me what thou thinkst of me. She then gets more romantic. And you know that because of the way she's now addressing it. 
the other uh, prose to verse uh, example I wanted to give you was a very famous one from Julius Caesar. Did you all have to read Julius Caesar in school? I'm assuming no? So if you remember, uh, after they assassinate Caesar, and assassination, by the way, is a word that is first used by Shakespeare, um, they then have to speak to the crowd to explain what they've done. And Brutus is, uh, has a wonderful speech. It's very rhetorical. Uh, it is in prose. So it goes something, part of it, it goes like this. Romans, countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom, wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus' love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend a man why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I love Caesar less, but that I love Rome more. And it goes pretty well. Everybody's like, yes, we, we agree. This is probably right. He was a tyrant. Then they make a terrible mistake. And they let Caesar's friend Antony have the second speech. <laughs> and it's in verse. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come not to bury Caesar. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often terred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus had told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously had Caesar answered it. Here on the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. Oh, but Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He had brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. It's a better speech. <laughs> it's probably more realistic in a way. It's more romantic. It's more, but it's in poetry. The previous speech is more rhetorical. It uses more tropes and figures as argument, which they would have learned, even as children, how to do. But it is. It's, a, it's somewhat mechanical in its form. And so when you are given free reign with this, this other form, this poetic form, it's actually more powerful. How to get off stage? Well, often with... Uh, Shakespeare made it easier on his actors by having the characters often leave after a rhyming couplet. So, after uh, Claudius finishes praying, he says, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. That's it, he's out. <laughs> Rachiano actually ends the play of Merchant of Venice with a couplet. Well, while I live, I'll fear no other thing. So sore as keeping safe, no verses ring. Full oh, curtain. There is no curtain, so that's the curtain. Uh, Kent is banished by King Lear. He says, Thus Kent, O princess, bid you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Oh, he's got books. <laughs> also, he puts in a dialogue that tells you what the gestures are. At one point, Lord Polonius says to the king, Take this from this, if this be otherwise. He's actually, the stage direction's added by modern editors. He says, take this from this, if this be otherwise. You see? <laughs> when Hamlet decides not to kill Claudius because he's praying right before those other lines, he says, up sword, and know thou a more hard event. He takes the sword away and is not going to now kill him with it. When people, um, swear or beg um, or ask a favor or forgiveness or a blessing, they will often go to their knees and they will say so, so that they know they're supposed to do that. Here on my knee, before high heaven and you. So they have to have been kneeling, otherwise it's going to look really funny when they say that, they're standing there. Also, when characters take an oath or swear, they are swearing to heaven. Oaths are taken very 
very seriously because they're to God. And in the Globe Theater, when they looked up and swore, they were looking at a painting of the heavens. They were looking right at it. And to forswear, to go back on something you swore, would damn you. So whenever somebody swore something, they meant it. And they would usually swear in some way, like this. Characters also tell other characters what to do, only enough. When the Countess first suspects how they loves her son in that same scene earlier, she says, she asks her some questions. She's interrogating her. What is your pleasure, madam? Uh, Countess says, you know, Helen, I am a mother to you. She's playing with words here because, you know, Helena wants to be the wife of her son, so she would, she would be her mother-in-law. You know, Helen, I am a mother to you, my honorable mistress. She's not gonna, she's not gonna admit that. That's a shared line. Nay, a mother. Why not a mother? When I said a mother, me thought you saw a serpent. <laughs> What's in mother that you start at it? She must have some kind of reaction. She must start at the word. And what you do about nothing when Hero is rejected by Claudio? Everyone is left on stage after Claudio and Don Pedro, and Don Pedro's evil brother Don John Lee, and they're trying to work out what to do. And during this period, Beatrice had very little to say, and if you know that character, she has always has a lot to say. And so, she's quiet. She didn't have any lines for a while, but this is explained when everybody leaves and leaves Benedict alone with her. And, she's, and he says, Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? To which she replies, yea, and I will weep a while longer, which indicates, of course, that she's been crying through other people's lines. In uh, Hamlet, you all know Hamlet too, right? You had to read that as well? Remember that the, play, the players show up in uh, Elsinore, and Hamlet gets the idea later that he's going to use them to put on a play that mirrors what happened with his father and his uncle. Uh, but first he asks uh, the player king to perform. And the player king does. He does this whole speech that uh, refers to uh, Priam, Hecuba, etc. And by the end of it, he actually is uh, a very good actor, and so he actually feels what he's saying. <laughs> so in case you weren't sure that he was doing that, Polonius says, look, whether he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes, Pray you no more. Later, when Hamlet is alone and he decides that he's going to do something about it and use the players in his famous Rogue and Peasant uh, slave speech, he reminds us of what the player did. And if someone was to look at that, they would have some cues as to how that might have worked. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, it force his soul, so it was on conceit, that from her working, all his visage warm, goes pale, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. So he actually lists out things that the actor was probably doing, or the character was. There are a lot of references to hands. In fact, there's a new book about hands uh, out, but, and how they're used uh, throughout Shakespeare. But people often say to each other, give me thy hand, so you know that you're going to have to shake somebody's hand. Uh, Oliver reveals that his brother grabs him when he says, well, thou lay hands on me, villain. Uh, Hamlet, right before he, he wants to follow the ghost, but his friends are afraid the ghost is actually the spirit that will damn him, and they, they grab him. And he says, unhand me, gentlemen. I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. So he, uh, he, he, they've obviously grabbed him at that point. When Lear uh, uh, finally meets up with the daughter he's rejected, Cordelia, there are a number of lines that tell you what happens. I put what, what probably is needed to happen in the parentheses of the brackets. 
She says that let this kiss repair those silent harms. So she must kiss him. He thinks he might be dreaming because he sees her. He doesn't believe that they're back together. And he says, let's see. I feel this pen prick. So he must pinch himself or do something with a pen. You know how when you're dreaming and you, supposedly you pinch yourself and if you can feel the pinch, you're, you can't feel the pinch, you know you're dreaming and that wonderful thing you thought was happening in dream it really isn't happening. So he hurts himself to make sure he's awake. And then he says to her, be your tears wet? Yes, faith. So she must be crying. She says that, by the way. And he must touch her tears. Yes, faith. When Shakespeare wants his actors to be more emotional, he actually writes language that supports it. First of all, he puts a bunch of O's in, the, in his, in his, uh, his uh, first line. Uh, the O is by itself. It's an O, not an OH. And it indicates usually a, someone is in a passion of some kind. After Ophelia is rejected by Hamlet, the first line is, oh, what a noble mind is here our throne. That oh can be a lot of things, but it's mainly an indication of how upset she is. Beatrice is so angry that Claudio has rejected <laughs> uh, a hero that she says, oh, that I were a man, oh God, that I were a man. You know, that oh really helps. When, uh, at the beginning of the play, Helena is crying, everybody thinks she's crying over the death of her father, but she's actually crying because the man she's in love with is leaving. And they keep saying, no, she's crying because she's, you know, she's upset about that. And they finally leave, and she, by herself, she says, oh, we're not all. I think not on my father. She's actually thinking about her turning the count. He also uses poetic and metaphoric language to move the emotion. So, do you all know the Merchant of Venice? The, uh, you know, one of the, one of the really interesting things that it, it very fairy tale like is that Portia is this rich lady, beautiful lady, who's uh, lost her father, and in his will he says that she cannot marry anybody. Who, yeah, the person that marries her has to pick from three caskets, uh, and they have to figure out which one might be the right one. And they also have to sign something, by the way, that says, uh, if you pick the wrong one, you don't get to marry anybody. <laughs> That's a big sacrifice. Uh, they are gold, silver, and lead. Which, which, uh, which one do you think that her picture's in? Yeah, it's the lead one. And in fact, you know, there's a song that they actually sing before, while, he's, while her, the person she really loves is picking, and every line ends with a rhyme for lead. She might be cueing him in there. But she knows that he loves her. She loves him. Uh, the other people that have been choosing are not her types. And uh, luckily, they picked the wrong ones. But she's afraid he's going to pick the wrong one, and she's going to lose him. And so her language changes accordingly. Away, then, I am locked in one of them. If you do love me, you will find me out. And then she begins to refer to him as, as if this is a legendary story, and he's a legendary person in it. Now he goes with no less presence, but with much more love than young Alcides when he did redeem the virgin tribute paid by Howling Troy to the sea monster. She's referring to a completely different event and comparing the two. I stand for sacrifice, the rest aloof, or the Dardanian wire. You see, she's, because she's so involved in it, she uses a metaphor. Go Hercules, she says. <laughs> she compares it to Hercules. When Hamlet, again, he's trying to get away from them, they've, they've grabbed him, he says, unhand me, and they're not going to let him go, he goes into metaphor, he goes into uh, an ancient legend. My fate cries out and makes each petty artery in this body as hearty as the Nemean lion's nerve. Okay, you have to know who the Nemean, what the Nemean lion is, but uh, it has to do with Hercules, right? Um, but the idea is that they need bigger 
thoughts or bigger ideas to express themselves because that's where they are, they're that emotional or passionate. Richard III, before, uh, he, if you remember the famous line, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Because they keep killing all the horses underneath him and he's, he's fighting uh, for his life and uh, he's fighting against his enemies and, and you know, the, his, um, his servant says, hey, come on, I'll help you to a horse, let's leave. And he says, slave, I have set my life upon a cast and will stand the hazard of the die. In other words, I am now going to roll for one. We'll see if I'm lucky or not. <laughs> Coriolanus is a, an interesting play in which um, it's, it's one of my favorites, but it's not done a lot. But basically, uh, it's about one of the great warriors of Rome. And uh, his name is actually Caius Martius. And the reason he's called Coriolanus is because at one point, he's, he and his troops are attacking a city, and they repel all the troops, and he's stuck inside. And they close the gates, and he's in there by himself, and he kills everybody. But he basically destroys the city by himself. So they call him Coriolanus. It would be like someone who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima could be called Mr. Hiroshima. It's not the greatest title in the world. Okay. But he's now retired. He's done what he was supposed to do. So what will we do with a retired general? Oh, we'll make him into a politician. That'll work. So they make him into a politician. And that doesn't work out very well at all. And he, he does not want to deal with the common people. He does not want to represent them. And so finally, they can't stand it anymore. They said, we're going to banish you. Uh, you know, you're not behaving. To which he replies, using metaphor, you common cry of curs, whose breath I hate as reek of the rotten fens, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air, I banish you. He's going to go over to the other side, become the general for them, and attack Rome. Bad, 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 bad idea. Okay. Um, another word that he uses, uh, that Shakespeare uses a lot, that kind of indicates uh, a, a gesture, is uh, when someone says thus, it can often be followed by the thing they just talked about. So, um, Othello, and you pardon the language in here, it's a, it's a bit racist, I think. Uh, Othello is just about to kill himself. He's already killed Desdemona, and he realizes what he's done. And he says, you know, let me speak before, before you take me away. And they go, okay. And he says, and say besides, that in Aleppo once, where a malignant and turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and produced a state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus, and then he stabs himself. And that's how it dies. <clears throat> thus. So he does the same thing that he describes. There's a funny version of that by Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream because he's doing Kermis and Thisbe and he's supposed to kill himself thinking that Thisbe has been killed by the lion. And so he says, thus I die, but he obviously stabs himself more than once. Thus I die, thus, 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 you see. He overdoes it. <laughs> thus, thus, thus. <coughs> by the way, they also use the audience a lot because they they were right there and they could see them. And when um, Hamlet finds out from the ghost that Claudius is guilty, he says he's alone and the ghost is left and he says, my tables, mean it is I set it down that one may smile and smile and be a villain. Well, you know, people in the audience had their tables, they had their little notebooks, and they would write down the lines they liked. And, you know, by the way, there was somebody writing down all the lines, that there was, there were people writing down lines from the plays, and we think maybe that's where some of the bad versions come from, perhaps. But the tables are in the audience, and so he might actually have reached down and said, my tables, and grabbed one of their notebooks and said, neat it is, I set it down. That one may smile, and smile, and be a villain. There you go. Uh, there's another fun thing that I think happens more than we know which is that since these actors are playing all these different roles, they're also, and Julius Caesar was written around the same time as Hamlet, it's very possible that people still remember the performance and that maybe it came back. But there's a passage when the, when the play within the play is about to take place, and Hamlet starts talking to Polonius about his school days. He says, my lord, you, you played in the university once. And he says, not did I, my lord was accounted a good actor. Hamlet says, what did you enact? 
And he says, I did an act Julius Caesar. I was killed in the Capitol. Brutus killed me. Well, it's very possible that the man playing Polonius played Caesar. That the man who played Brutus is playing Hamlet. Because Brutus is the lead role in that play. And so it's actually also foreshadowing for what, hap for what happens later in this play, which is that Hamlet kills Polonius. In other words, the actor kills the actor again. It was a brute part of him to kill so capital like half there, and so he left about that. He the players ready. Also, by the way, there are stage directions. <laughs> I seem to apply them. <coughs> there are some. Uh, there are some really odd ones. Uh, by the way, there's a dictionary of stage directions for a lot of the early modern uh, drama, and they're really fascinating. And they tell you some things like uh, there's a thing called the sick chair. And apparently, when someone is brought out in it, you can tell that they're ill because of the chair they're sitting in. So if a king is brought out in a sick chair, you know that he's near death. And you know, that may have happened in all as well as it well. um, But some of my favorites are, you know, Coriolanus decides he's going to attack. Let me go back. He's going to attack Rome. He's a Roman general. And so they send people to try to convince him not to. And they send his wife. They send his best friend. It doesn't work. And then they send his mother. You know, according to this is a mama's boy. And the mother has this long speech. And at the end of the speech, there's a stage direction. And it is, he holds her by the hand, silently. So she got him. He then says, Oh, mother, mother, what have you done? Because he's not going to attack Rome now. And by the way, he will be killed at the end of the play because of it. Uh, it is the tragedy, of course. <coughs> the most famous, probably, <laughs> stage direction of all is Antigonus. Uh, goes to an island to get rid of Laontes' baby, who he swears is not a legitimate baby. And suddenly he hears something coming. And he realizes that it's a bear. And he says, this is the chase. I am gone forever. And the stage direction is, exit pursued by bear. <laughs> it's very possible they could have had a bear that worked, because they had bear baiting pits. And uh, there were bears around, you know, right next door. Uh, have to be careful how that worked, I guess. The way that that stage is very interesting sometimes. You know, how do you get the bear out there? Um, another of my favorites is an early play, Henry VI, Part Three. One of the villains, if you will, of the play is young Clifford. It says at the beginning of the scene, enter young Clifford with an arrow in his neck. And I always picture that kind of Steve Martin thing with the arrow. <laughs> uh, there are companies that have actually done all of these plays again, and they, it does work, actually. It's, it's funnily enough, it's an odd and kind of absurd thing, but it makes sense. So 400 years later, 400th anniversary of, this, of Shakespeare's death was two years ago. We, we have different challenges now, right? We have, we have to try to make the plays more accessible to modern audience. And we have to try to make them fresh without distorting them, I think. And, but we have all of these theater personnel at our disposal, including a director. We have people to design things. We have technology. We have electricity. We can do things indoors more. They moved indoors uh, when Shakespeare was doing his work, but it was all lit by candlelight. Uh, the new Wanamaker Theater that's, next, that's attached to the Globe is actually one of those Jacobean theaters, and you can see how that works. Um, staging it, I just found this. This is a, this is a, uh, a program of, through the new Globe, you can actually stage a play by Shakespeare, uh, stage a scene by Shakespeare on your laptop. Well, you could just do it with a computer is what I'm getting at. Also, finally, uh, each actor had their own script. So they can go off and learn it together. Um, I, th you know, I, I think what's wonderful for me is that um, it's fun to be play detective and find these things in the plays. But the nice thing is that there's 400 years of research and these plays have been done and done and done, and so, you know, if you have an issue with something that's happening in the play, somebody's probably already done it at least three times. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to steal everything that they do, but it sometimes solves the problems. 
uh, the famous director Peter Hall said he wanted to write a pamphlet on what you do when you and when Hamlet and Laertes jump into the grave with Ophelia. Because at one point they're supposed to lift her. He, he's supposed to lift her up. So are they dancing on the body? I mean, this doesn't seem that would be a good idea. Right? So he has ways around that. Anyway, um, what, you know what I didn't talk about also is that they the poets. Um, uh, including Shakespeare, have ways of cheating, you know, that you would think 10 lines is really hard to do all the time. Well, it is. So uh, sometimes what they'll do is they'll lengthen a word so it'll fit, the line will fit. That's why you get those lines that have the ED pronounced. Uh, Queen Gertrude says, and there I see such black and grainy spots instead of grain spots. And so that it fits the line. Or you'll have words that are alighted together. One of the most famous ones is, ones we, is one we still use. The word even is shortened to een. It means evening, and we still have it when we say, Happy Halloween. Okay? And they don't say it's, they say tis, uh, for it is. So there are lots of ways to, to put, push things together, push them apart. Um, one of my other favorites is, see if you can count this, uh, Juliet says, Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? How many syllables is that? Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? It's like 14 syllables. But what he did with a lot of names that had that kind of uh, structure to them is that you can press them together. So it's actually, oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And you get that extra 11 syllable for free. Okay. This is why you know, he, he loves having characters like Troilus, because you can say either Troilus syllables or Troilus. And in fact, there's a passage he has with Cressida, in Troilus and Cressida, where she calls him both, because it fits the meter better. So, um, I thought I'd open it up to comments or questions. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, class, for being here.